It's you. Actually, no, it's me. <laughs> um, so we're going to be looking at Matthew uh, this morning. Now, if how many people were at the sunrise service this morning? A bunch of you. We had almost 100 people at the sunrise service this morning at 7 a.m., and it was awesome. And I want to say all of you that were there got to be blessed by that. I said, listen, my friends, there's a 10% chance of rain, but a 100% chance of resurrection. Somebody say amen. We're looking at Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and then sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him, and they became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, just as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. Everybody say fear. They went out with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, there was Jesus. He met them, saying, Rejoice. So they came, and they held him by the feet, and they worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Now, Matthew's account is a little bit different than John's. Uh, all of the four Gospels uh, have a different account slightly. Now, one of them is not more true than the others. It's God's words. It's infallible. It's inerrant. It is the supreme authority. But I always say this to you because it doesn't matter what gospel I'm preaching from. I need you to remember that there are different accounts based on perspectives. Now, if you were to see a car accident, unfortunately, that would be horrible, but you would see it from one corner of the street separate from the other corner of the street. Your description might be slightly different. See, in the story this morning, it talked about Mary Magdalene, but now it's talking about two women. It says, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. It doesn't say here that they came to see Jesus. It doesn't say here that they came to see the risen Christ. No, the Bible says that they came to see the tomb. And in verse 2, while they were going to see the tomb, there was a great earthquake, my friends. Matthew reports something that is very significant in the resurrected story. Because there was an earthquake Matthew is the only writer who writes about the earthquake. And the earthquake did not cause the stone to roll away. If anything, the angelic rolling of the stone then prompted the earthquake. Somebody say amen. When God moves, the world moves. Amen? When God moves in you, you move. It's God's Spirit that causes things to quake. And it happens in that order. And also in verse 2, an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door. And then he just sat upon it. 
Oh, I like that. I like that. God can do anything he wants, but he chooses now to have his angel set for a while. We don't know how long. But when the women came to the tomb, they saw the stone was rolled away with an angel that was now sitting on the stone. The door to the tomb was wide open so it could be seen. Indeed, there needed not any angel at all to remove the stone. If this had been all he had come down for, he that was quickened by the Spirit could by the same power have rolled the stone away. But it was as fit for the angels who had been witnesses of the passion of Christ, the crucifixion, my friends, that they could also be witnesses of the great resurrection. Remember, it wasn't just Mary and the other Mary who wanted to enjoy what God was doing. All the hosts in heaven were glorifying Jesus. So God allowed the angels to play a part. And as we continue on in the story, the Bible says that the guards were there guarding the tomb. Who guards a dead man? Unless you don't believe he's dead. You see, you know the story as well as I do. If we were to go back a little bit, the, 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 uh, the leaders, the teachers, the, the, uh, the Pharisees, they said, listen to Pontius Pilate. He told his followers that he would rise again, and I'm a little concerned now that somebody will come and steal the body, and if they steal the body, it may be worse at the end than it was at the beginning. Pilate thinks they're crazy, but he doesn't care. He says, go, make the tomb as secure as you know how. Two guards should be sufficient, my friends. Roman soldiers responsible for guarding the tomb were terrified. Why? Because the angelic presence made these professional soldiers tremble and faint. There's something about being in the presence of God, my friends, that just makes you tremble. There's something about being in the presence of godly people that just starts to sense in your own spirit there's an anointing around you. For God is close. Yes, I believe that with all my heart. And I know when I am in the presence of God and I know that when God is doing something in my life and God is giving me wisdom and God is manifesting Himself in me, my friends, Sometimes I tremble. Sometimes I shake and sometimes I get excited and sometimes I get passionate. But I don't get fearful. You see, I'm not a soldier. And I know Jesus and I know him who makes me quake. But they didn't know Jesus who made them quake. And so they were quaking, they were shaking, and the earth was shaking. And all this is happening at the same time. He is not here, the women were told, for he has risen. For the first time, the followers of Jesus, these faithful women, heard what they did not expect to hear. They heard that Jesus was not in the tomb, but had risen to the resurrection life. Finally, what Jesus has said is now become true, my friends. There are several examples in the Bible of people being resuscitated before this. Such as the widow's son in the days of Elijah. Lazarus. Each of these was resurrected or resuscitated from death, but none of them were actually resurrected in glory. Each of them was raised in the same body in which they died. 
and raised from the dead to eventually die again. We are not talking about Lazarus, my friends. Many of you don't want to die once. He had to die twice. But Jesus was glorified by resuscitating Lazarus. Jesus will be glorified in the resurrection because he said he would be glorified in the resurrection. And Jesus always does what he always said. But they didn't believe him. That's why the women went to the tomb. You see, the Bible says they went to see the tomb. They did not go to see Jesus. Oh, but they got more than they bargained for. How many people can say, oh, Lord Jesus, I got more than I bargained for. I didn't know that the life in Christ was going to be this sweet. I didn't know the joy I would have in my heart. God, when I came to you on that day, October 23rd, 1993, with tears in my eyes, I didn't know it would change my life forever. I think most of us, if we were honest, would say we did not know what he was going to do in our life. Yet we were expectant and we exercised faith and we experienced grace and our lives were forever changed. And he said, he reminded the women and all the disciples that they should have expected this because it was just as he had promised. A little bit of a rebuke. Just a little one. You came to visit the tomb. You should have come to visit Jesus. But that's okay. That's okay. We're all mistaken sometimes. Just don't think that you've come to an empty tomb. Because God's got something better for you. Somebody say amen. Don't be happy with the status quo, my friends. Don't come to church just to visit your friends. Don't come into the sanctuary because it's beautiful. Don't come to church to hear the choir, though they're great. We come here to worship and meet with Jesus because this is where he is. And he wasn't here when you got here. You brought him here. So it doesn't matter if you're in your living room. It doesn't matter if you're in church. And it doesn't matter if you're in your car on the way to work. Jesus is where you are. You don't have to go and see a tomb. You don't have to go and meet with Jesus. Because you can meet with him anytime and anywhere. The fact of the resurrection is clear enough, my friends. We must also grapple with the meaning of the resurrection. Simply, Jesus' resurrection proved that his death was an actual propitiation for sin and that the Father had accepted it as such. The cross was the payment. The resurrection was the receipt, proving that the payment was accepted in full. Sometimes I take people out for lunch, and when I do, sometimes it's on the church's dime. Only when I go to the really nice restaurants, though. I'm not talking chilies and uh, all that other stuff. I'm talking, you know, five-star, the best restaurants. I'm teasing. But this is a good church, and Bev likes me to turn in my receipts, so that way I can get reimbursed. But sometimes I lose my receipts. Yeah, I hate it when that happens. I guess lunch is on me today. <laughs> for those of you that are at home, somebody's clapping and saying, all right, pastor's taking everybody out for lunch. No, Bev still takes care of me because she trusts me. She trusts me. 
You see, guys, I think this slide is important. We're going to put it back up. The cross was the payment, but the resurrection was the receipt, proving that the payment was fully accepted. I found that this week, and I thought, man, that is a nugget if I've ever seen one. I got to preach that because I got a receipt, my friends. I got a receipt. It's a big one. I keep it close to my heart. And it says the resurrection happened, my friends. It says Jesus did what he said he was going to do. And I don't have to give it to the business administrator. And I don't have to bring it to Park Place Church because I take it everywhere I go. It is my receipt to do anything I want to do for Christ. It allows me to tell anyone I want to tell about Jesus. That is my receipt, and it has been paid for in full because God is on the throne. Somebody say hallelujah. I believe it with all my heart, my friends. You have a receipt. It's been paid in full, my friends. Oh, these women were later grateful for the angel because the angel told them, See the place where they laid him. That's scriptural. See the place where they laid him, not the tomb. You didn't come here for the tomb. It's open. See the place where they laid him. It would have, it should have been enough to merely hear the testimony of the angel. That would have been enough for me. I would have been pleased. But it doesn't stop there. Nevertheless, when they saw it, it gave them ground to stand on even more solid than the testimony of the angel himself. One eye witness is better than 20 ear witnesses. Men will believe what you've seen even if they don't believe what you've heard, says Charles Spurgeon. Men will believe what you've seen, even if they don't believe what you've heard. Oh, I hear a lot of crazy stuff. Sometimes from some of you. People come in and share some of their testimonies or their, you know, you know their, their, their theology, you know, over the years. I've been a pastor 25 years, and I've heard some of the whacked out, craziest theology. People tell me things. I listen, I listen, I'm really kind, I'm nice. But if it can't be supported with Scripture, it goes in file 13. Don't tell me what you think you know. Don't tell me what you think you feel. Tell me what Jesus has done in your life. You see, I'm more interested in your testimony than your theology. Theology is just a big word, that's, it's the study of God. Nowadays, we've got this postmodern theology and progressive theology and this theology and that theology and all these different types of theology. Just give me theology. Don't add a word before it because I don't really need it to clarify your position. Because I'm not really concerned with your theology. I'm interested in God's theology. You see, this is the only PowerPoint I really need right here because it's God's point. It's God's theology. And Scripture interprets Scripture, my friends. Not your feelings, not your thoughts, not what you heard on TBN. Scripture interprets Scripture. And it'll keep you on the straight and narrow. And yes, you will make mistakes. And yes, you may be wrong about some of your theology. But I would rather be innocent and be wrong than be ignorant and unwilling to listen to proper theology. I think the Wesleyan Church has the greatest theology. We study the Word of God, and we preach the Word of God. And so they're told in verse 7, Go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. The angel commanded them to be the first messengers of the good news of Jesus' resurrection. Since these women were some of the few people courageous enough to publicly identify themselves with Jesus, that was an appropriate honor. 
I'm glad God chose women. Can I get an amen? He didn't choose Peter first to proclaim. Peter came later. John came later. He chose the women. Well, the women were there when he was crucified. Now, we know John was as well. Spurgeon says, not first to them who were the heads of the church, as it were, but first to all the lowly women did the Lord appear. And the apostles themselves had to go to school to Mary Magdalene and to the other Mary to learn this great truth. The Lord has risen indeed. Oh, how humbling that must have been for Peter. You know? You know Peter, right? We love Peter. The only time he puts his foot in his mouth is when he pulls the other one out. That's Peter. And now these women are coming to him and they're saying, Peter, this is what we're supposed to tell you. Who are you to tell me? I'm Peter. The rock. Cephas. See. No, 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 Peter, you don't understand. We were told to tell you that you need to go to Galilee. He is risen. He would have told me himself. I'm Peter. God chose women. I love it. I love it. They were with him every step of the way. I love it. He is going before you into Galilee, and there you will see him. This assured the women that they would see the resurrected Jesus, and they saw him. He wasn't simply raised from the dead. He was raised to continue his relationship with them. That's the beauty. Not simply raised from the dead to be, an, you know, a symbol or a sign, but that he would continue to have a relationship with them. Jesus was a relationship guru. He was the best social worker we've ever had. He loved these women. He was a therapist. He was compassionate. He was kind. He loved them. The Bible says they ran to bring the disciples' word. Filled with fear. I asked you to say that word because look at the slide. They were filled with fear and great joy at the same time. They did exactly what the angel told them to do. He told them to go quickly, and they did. My friends, when you're told to go quickly, you go quickly. Jesus said, go quickly. Jesus said, go now. They were so excited that they had fear and joy at the same time. Saints running in the way of obedience are like, very likely to be met by Jesus. Some Christians travel to heaven so slowly that they are overtaken by follies or by faults, says Spurgeon. They're overtaken by slumber or by Satan, but he who is in Christ running, footmen shall meet his master while they are speeding on the way. You all know I like Spurgeon and I share a lot of his quotes, but if you are running, who is going to slow you down? See, they weren't told to speed walk. I see some of you out there in the morning. You know how you do it. I see you speed walk or whatever you do. He didn't say walk quickly, don't trip. Some of you really like that. You want to see that again, don't you? <laughs> Brian, I'm not doing it again. I can't believe I did it once and people are already leaving. As they went, they went to tell the disciples. The women met Jesus as they obeyed the command to tell the news of the great resurrection. But Jesus met them, and the first thing he said is rejoice. What else could Jesus say to these women? Rejoice. 
What else could they do other than rejoice? I love that. But the Bible also says in verse 9, let's look at this on the screen. So they came and they held him by the feet and they worshiped him. When the women met Jesus, they felt compelled to worship him. An hour before, they thought everything was lost because they thought Jesus was dead. Now they knew everything was gained because Jesus was alive. Notably, Jesus received the worship of these ladies. If Jesus were not God, it would have been terribly sinful for them to worship him. But being God, it was good and appropriate for Jesus to receive their worship. I like that. Jesus doesn't say, no, please don't stop right there. Don't, don't touch. Save that for the Father. There's a day coming for that. No, no, no. Not me, not now. Jesus does warn them, I have not ascended to my Father yet, so don't hold on to me. He does say that. He does say that. But he allows them to touch him. He allows them to worship him, my friends. For he knows who he is. He knows what the Father has done for his people. And he says, do not be afraid. Go, ladies. Tell my brethren to go into Galilee, and there they will see me. They have to wait. You don't. Back to the women. I love the fact they didn't have to wait. Hallelujah. Yes, it's Women's Sunday here at Park Place Church. Jesus, he spent some time with the ladies and said, you know what? You didn't desert me. You were there every step of the way. For three and a half years, you took care of 12 stinky disciples. You cooked for them. You cleaned up after them. You ministered to them. You served them. Now they're not here, and you are. So you tell them to meet me in Galilee, and that is going to be where I am. And Jesus referred to them as my brethren. This is the first time our Lord called the disciples by this endearing name. They no doubt thought that their Lord would reproach them with their past cowardice, perhaps infidelity. I'm talking about the disciples, but he called them my brethren. But in speaking this, gives them a full assurance in the most tender terms that all was past and they were forgiven. My friends, they needed to be forgiven. They had sinned against Jesus. I think they broke his heart. I don't think he was surprised he actually said that they were going to fall away. But don't you know that when Jesus was arrested, and they followed at a distance, a couple of them, most of them just fled in any direction they could because they did not want to be crucified. At one time, they did not want to be associated with him. Do you? Do you want to be associated with him? Because if you do, even though you won't be crucified, you may be made fun of. If you do want to be associated with him, you have to say, I'm with him. I love him. I know him. And he knows my name as well. And there isn't anything in this life, good, bad, or indifferent, that can take away from that. I know him, and he is sweet, and his name is Jesus. And he changed my life, and he can change yours too. Perhaps there's someone here tonight, as the worship team comes back up, perhaps there's someone here tonight, and you're thinking, you know, I'm hearing this message, but uh, I'm a little more like Peter. Maybe I'm a little more like the disciples. I'm a little cowardly when it comes to talking about Jesus. It's not natural for me. I want to remind you, my friends, of something very, very important. He was not ashamed of you. 
let us not be ashamed of him. I want to go back a little bit further, and I'm going to close with a story. Now, this story will not be in the Bible. Yes, we want our prayer partners to come up too. Thank you. So if you need prayer after the service, they are here for you. I want to go back a little bit because when Jesus was crucified, it was Pontius Pilate that declared him guilty. Remember, the people said, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. But what has he done? Crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. I wash my hands of this man's death. And so there is Pontius Pilate, and there's a man by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea was probably a Pharisee. He was a very wealthy person. And we know that he gave up his tomb for Jesus. And so I imagine the conversation went something like this. Pilate said to his soldier, Make sure Joseph of Arimathea comes here and presents himself before me. I have a question for him, my friends. And Joseph of Arimathea walks into the room and he sees Pilate. And Joseph of Arimathea looks at him and he says, Joseph of Arimathea, you are wealthy. You've worked very hard for everything you have. You spent a lot of money for a tomb for you and your family. Why would you give it to a peasant man who claims to be the Messiah? And Joseph of Arimathea looks at Pontius Pilate and he says, it's only for the weekend. Somebody say hallelujah. He has risen, my friends. He has risen indeed. And today we celebrate the resurrected Savior. He didn't stay in the tomb. He only spent the weekend, my friends, because the grave couldn't hold him down. This world cannot hold him down. There is nothing that can hold our Jesus down. Somebody say amen. Please stand with us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time today. As we sing this last song and close in Benedict, Lord, we pray right now that the Holy Spirit and the fire of God be upon this place, Lord. That you would pour out your Spirit on all flesh, Lord. That we would be empowered by the Holy Spirit because Jesus rose from the grave. And that same Spirit that raised Jesus from the grave lives in us. The grave couldn't hold him down. The soldiers couldn't hold him back. And those who drove the nails couldn't keep them on the cross. And so we thank you, Father, for sending us Jesus, that our lives will never be the same. If we confess our sins, God, you will forgive us. If we proclaim the name of Jesus as our Lord and Savior, our lives will be forever changed. We say thank you, Lord, for doing for us what we could not do for ourselves, for loving us much greater than we could ever love ourselves for showing us mercy when we didn't deserve it. You pour out your grace on us. Perhaps somebody needs to come forward this morning. Perhaps there's some unfinished business in your church, Lord. That's what the prayer partners are for. Nobody prays alone at Park Place Church. Let us all come and see the empty tomb. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing this last song together.